104 in the front of the hill. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord.
remember this, the fifth Sunday after Pentecost. Before it for us in the 19th chapter of Leviticus, verses 9 to 18, starting with the ninth verse. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge. Neither shall you gather the gleanings after you harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyard bare. Neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the soldier. I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal. You shall not deal falsely. You shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely. And so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired servant shall not remain with you all night until the morning. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or refer to the great, but in righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading for us this morning, or to cross in the first chapter of Colossians, verses 1 to 14, starting with the first verse. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ, and Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid out for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed the whole world, its very fruit and growing, as it does among you. Since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God and truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us the love in the Spirit. So, from this day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power, according to his glorious light, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in life. He has delivered us 
from the way of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is the word of the Lord.
of our living Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text of today's invitation comes to us from the Gospel lesson. Which of these three do you make room to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you tell and do likewise. This is the gospel of the Lord. So these words spoken by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and penned by St. Luke, the blessed evangelist, and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Reminded me what his vocation is God's mercy. Mercy begins with our God's love and compassion. With love and compassion, we look to our neighbor to identify his needs. And most especially, if he is ensnared, hot, and held in bondage to a bad situation and circumstance. And it's really, really bad. So bad he can't get out of it. So bad he can't even attend to his need. Must depend upon someone to come from the outside and attend to his need for him. And when this happens, this is having mercy. There's also yet another connotation to God's mercy. And this is God's mercy. And that connotation is this. Sometimes people decide, sometimes people will find God's mercy as not getting what we deserve, but getting what we don't deserve. And for you and me, it happens this way. You and I, as God's people, are well aware of the fact that we sin every day by thought, word, and deed. We are well aware of the fact that because of our sins, we deserve only one thing. Punishment and eternal condemnation. But our God has had mercy upon us and sent his son down from above and from the oak below to be the Savior, to give to us faith, forgiveness of sins, the promise of eternal, of eternal salvation. This is our God's mercy. This brings us to the gospel lesson for today. In the gospel lesson for today, we find our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the teacher. And now he's teaching the white boy, the multitudes, the common people. And all of a sudden, without a warning, without notice, blew in this tribute person, rich lawyer guy. And he arrived big time. And it was all about him. He arrived in his Maserati chariot. He walked up to Jesus wearing his Armenian robes, Gucci sandals, and Oakley beard sunglasses. And he came up to Jesus and he asked Jesus, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus, the teacher, is God and he is all knowing. He knows everything about this guy. So the teacher responded, So how do you read the law, the Torah, the sacred scriptures? And Mr. Beautiful Person, Lord and I answered this way, Love the Lord your God, with all your heart, and your soul, and your strength, and your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And the teacher responded by saying, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you shall live. But there was something in the teacher's voice, something in the teacher's words. He saw Mr. Beautiful Person, rich young lawyer, guy, asked the question, oh, by the way, who is my neighbor? And it's good to realize at this point in time that Mr. Beautiful Person, rich young lawyer, guy, is my neighbor in a very narrow way. To him a neighbor who is someone just like him. Someone who is rich and well to do. Someone who was well educated. Someone who is on the upper crust and higher class of Jewish culture and society. That was his neighbor. With a narrow definition like that, that these were not his neighbors. The common ordinary people were not his neighbors. The tax collector was 
not his neighbor. Most importantly, a Samaritan was not his neighbor. Those Samaritans, those who lived in the north of Israel, those who married and intermarried with the Babylonians after the Babylonian captivity, those second-class people. The Jews hated the Samaritans, and so in turn, the Samaritans hated the Jews, and they were mortal enemies. That Samaritan was not a neighbor. He was a beautiful person, rich guy, lawyer. So the question posed to the teacher was, and it was my neighbor. And the teacher answered by speaking the parable of the Good Samaritan. So there's this Jewish guy going down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. Without warning, without notice, he was attacked and he was assaulted by bad guys, robbers. They beat him to a pole. They stripped him of all his clothes. All they had left was underwear to wear. They robbed him of all his money, and then they left him for dead at the side of the road. First one to pass by was a Jewish priest. He would have been a neighbor to Mr. Beautiful Person, Rich Guy Lawyer. He didn't stop to help, just kept cruising by. Next one to pass by was a Levitical priest. He would have been a neighbor to Mr. Beautiful Person, Rich Guy Lawyer. He didn't stop to help, just kept cruising by. Finally, a Samaritan. A Samaritan. And he had compassion and love for the Indian Jewish guy lying by the side of the road. And he stopped to help. He did something about it. He had mercy upon him. He got out the oil, he poured the oil on the wound. He got out the bandages and he bandaged up the wound. And the Samaritan must have been a pretty strong guy. He lifted the Jewish guy off the side of the road, up and onto his animal, his donkey. And he led him into the next town, to the next inn, hotel. And there was room at the inn this time. So the Samaritan pulled the guy off his animal, his donkey, and carried him into the inn and down the hallway to the room, and laid him on the bed, and then sat next to him and watched over him all night. Morning came. Morning had broken. The sun arose. The time of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so too the Samaritan arose. He had a down the innkeeper. He gave the innkeeper two denarii. He said, here's two denarii. It should cover the cost of the room for the night. But now I got a bounce. I got a cruise. Places I gotta go, people I gotta see, things I gotta do, business to take care of. But I want you, innkeeper, to watch over that guy and take care of that guy. And know that I'm coming back this way as I return on my trip. And I promise you, if there's any additional cost, I will pay the bill in full. So the teacher then turned to Mr. Beautiful Person, Rich Guy Lawyer, and asked the question. Which of these three was a neighbor to the injured guy by the side of the road? And Mr. Beautiful Person, Rich Guy Lawyer responded, the one who had mercy. And Jesus said, you, no, and you also. In the same manner, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the teacher said two really important things. The first is this. Our God comes to us. He fills us with himself in the word and sacraments, and he fills us with his mercy. So you and I can go out there and identify the need of our neighbor and have mercy upon him and attend to his need. The second is this. Neighbor is anybody who is in need next to you, whether they're an atheist or a Buddhist or a Muslim, or a Jew, or whatever. If they are in need, they are your neighbor. So is your family members. 
know what's down with me. In this parable, you and I are like the Good Samaritan and also like the Jewish priest and the Levitical priest. You and I are like the Good Samaritan. There's a lot of times when you and I go and help our neighbor according to his need. When we give food that goes to a local food pantry, we take our clothes to the secondhand store so that they can have clothes to wear. When we help our neighbor in the wintertime, who's not able to get out and shovel the sidewalk in the driveway and clear the sidewalk and driveway of snow. In all those ways, we are reflecting God's mercy through our thoughts and our words and action and giving to Him all praise and honor and glory. There's also times we do not help and there's reasons for this. One is because we're really busy people. Some things in your life, my life, are time sensitive. It's got to be done today, not tomorrow, not next week, not next month. It has to be done today. I'd like to help. I got no time. Sorry, I cannot help. Another reason is because sometimes we get weak and weary, and tired and worn out. Our get up and go gets up and goes. We'd like to help, but we're so tired, we could cry. We'd like to help, but we believe that when our head hits the pillow, we're going to sleep until next Friday. And then there is the person we're supposed to help, our neighbor. Lord, really? You want me to go and help him? He is my mortal enemy. He does everything in his power to hurt me and harm me. And you want me to go and help him? Really, Lord? Lord, you want me to go and help him? He is sketchy as all get out. He's got more paint and artwork on him than a whole boxcar being pulled by the Burlington Northern freight train. Lord, look at him. He's sketchy big time. He's got this huge nose ring that belongs to the nose of a bull, and he's wearing an earring that is as big as the lure that you use to catch muskies. Really? Sketchy, Lord? I don't know, Lord. And you want me to help him? And so instead of doing something, we do nothing. Instead of saying something, we say nothing. You and I all have a sinful flesh. Every one of us. Every one of us. All the short. So we look to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is not all short. He is the Good Samaritan with mercy. He is also the new Jewish guy by the side of the road. He is the Good Samaritan who is looked down from all from the outside. As our Lord and Savior who paid the redeeming price of Paul, look down upon mercy. He has seen you and me trapped, and snared, and held in bondage. You and I got to live in this body, this body with the sinful flesh. The good we want to say is that we say. The good we want to do is that the good that we do. You and I are trapped in living in the fallen and broken world with the only one Paul who shoots his darts at you and me. 24-7. You and I at the end got to face the enemy of death. You and I got to live in a fallen, broken world that hates you and me because you and I are Christians. We believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior and Redeemer. Jesus is the good Samaritan who has had mercy upon us by allowing himself to be the injured guy by the side of the road. In his passion, he too was beaten. As he was crucified, he was crucified outside the holy city of Jerusalem, on the road going outside of Jerusalem. In his passion, he too was stripped. In his passion, he too was robbed of all his life, of his body, and all his blood, to pay the redeeming price so he could conquer all of sin with his righteousness, all of Satan with his love, all of death with resurrection and new life. For a very important reason.
So you and me, we have life, forgiveness, and salvation. And so every time you and I look at the cross and the empty tomb, every time you and I look at the death and resurrection of Christ, we see with God's mercy is all alone. Now it comes back to you. Now it comes back to me. You and I live in a fallen and broken world. It's a hard place to live. It's a tough place to live. Now our job is to make our pilgrimage going down the road to that little plot to the promised land. And as you and I make that journey, sometimes you and I are attacked and assaulted by bad people. How easy it is for you and I to be attacked and assaulted by bad people and be beaten up and smacked down. There's lots of ways to be beaten up and smacked down physically, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically. And here's the deal. If you're one who's been beaten and smacked down, you are beaten and smacked down. How easy it is to be robbed. Look at all the security protocols you and I got to follow because all the scammers out there who are like nothing more than take all of my money and all of your money. How easy it is to be stripped of love and respect and honor. How easy it is to be stripped of a good reputation and a good name. Slattering is what everybody is doing these days. How easy it is to have our name and our reputation dragged in the mud, especially over the internet. And if all this happened to you, and if all this happened to me, then left for dead by the side of the road with no one else to help. So Jesus continues to be the good Samaritan, filled with mercy. This is the Lord's Inn. This is the Lord's house on the Lord's day. This is the place where the great physician comes to you and me to heal us when we are hurting. The church is not a gymnasium. The church is a hospital for those who are hurting. Jesus, the good shepherd, he does his best work in healing through his word and his sacraments. In the certain order that he follows, first the law, then the gospel. You have to first die in Christ to then be resurrected in Christ. You've got to be first brought down by the law in order to be raised up by the gospel. You've got to be thrust to the law, running down all of our pride and arrogance and lying dirt and dust to nothing. So as we hear the gospel and our sins are forgiven, we are lifted up and resurrected and can be, and can be everything in Christ. This is the Lord's end. This is the Lord's hospital. <clears throat> Jesus only wants sinners so we can forgive them. Jesus only wants those who are weak so we can be their strength. Jesus only wants those who are hopeless so we can be their hope. Jesus only wants those who are helpless so we can be their help. Jesus only wants those who are hurting so that he can come with them. Jesus only wants those who are trapped in darkness of frustration depression and despair, so that he can reveal to them that he is the light of the world. The light is always more powerful than darkness. Darkness was always complete of light. There is no darkness in life the world so dark that his light and love cannot overpower. And for all those times, you and I feel like that Jewish guy injured by the side of the road, beaten, stripped, and robbed, and abandoned by everybody, left for dead. Jesus promises you and me, I will never forsake you. I will never forget you. I will never abandon you. I will always come to you in your hour of need. To listen when no one else will listen. To understand when no one else gets you. To help when no one else will help. For those times you were falling down and can't get up, to pick you up and carry you down the road from the baptismal pond to the promised land. But it's a pool of cool water to the 
next green pasture. This is Jesus, our good Samaritan. Our good Samaritan who is filled with mercy. This is your Jesus and my Jesus, filled with mercy. The one you and I can always trust in, can always count on, can always depend upon, no matter what. Today, tomorrow, or all of eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. And on the peace of God, we pass the human understanding. May it bless you, faith, life, everlasting. Amen. Let us now stand and sing the creed.